and we are live. I'd like to welcome everyone to another episode of Heart to Heart with Bree. Tonight's topic is opportunities for minorities in real estate ownership. And my guests are Herbert Buckley and Myra. Is it Avolas? I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name correctly. It's Avalos. Avalos. Okay, I do apologize. Okay. Please introduce yourselves to the viewers. Go ahead, Herbert. Why me first? What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody. Okay. Hi, guys. How y'all doing? Herbert. Um, Herbert Buckley. Um, um, been in real estate for a couple of years now, and um, I want to say thanks to Bridget for for, for the Bree for Bree, bringing me back for a second time. Um, I'm I'm here in North Texas, um, right between Dallas and Fort Worth, in the Arlington area, and um, I try my best to help everybody. With real estate, home ownership, investing, um, we keep busy, right? Don't we? Don't we, Myra? We, we yes, keep busy. sir. We do. Yeah, yeah. Your turn, Myra. So, uh, my name is Myra Avalos. I am with Cardinal Financial, and we are a local lender that we service Dallas, Fort Worth, Tarrant County, Ellis County, but licensed in the state of Texas. So, we can help anyone that is looking to purchase in Texas. Okay, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. I'd like to welcome my friends Mikey Go and Joyce. Thank you so much for tuning in. So I'll begin right away with my first question, which is, is it ever too late for home ownership? Good question. No, it's never too late. It's always a good time to purchase. People purchase homes in various stages of their life. So whether someone is 20, 40, 60 and beyond, there's all, it's always a good investment and always, you know, you want to have something to call your own. So it's always, it's just a matter of finding out what your budget is, what your wants are and speaking to a real estate professional like Herbert and myself to get you started. And, 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 you okay and, that, Herbert? and, and again, you know, the, 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 as far as um, minorities are concerned, um, we've missed out on some opportunities because there are opportunities out there. And again, it, it comes down to what you want. What you want. If you, if you, if you, if your focus is to potentially create some wealth and possibly leave some kind of tangible asset for your, um, you know, your, your kids and the grandkids, that kind of thing. Real estate does work. I, I mean, that's been my experience, and um, I've always been motivated to 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 get involved in real estate. And um, it took me a few years to 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 to, to you know, change roles um, after being, you know, with one organization for 26 years, and now joining um, Century 21 here in North Texas. But again, um, I, I, I saw it as a tangible way um, where people can, you know, again, leave some kind of legacy, leave some kind of legacy, and you know. Am I too old? Am I too young? Again, it depends on what you want. That's the bottom line. I mean, I'll tell you point blank that, that buying a property or buying real estate is is not for everyone. Okay, but if if you if if that's something that you want to do, absolutely. Okay. I appreciate your honesty on that. What is the ideal credit rating that is needed to purchase a home? So credit score requirements depend on the type of loan that. that the buyer's qualifying for and also the lender. So ideally you want to be at least a 620 to 850, which is the highest credit score. The higher your credit score, the better opportunities you will have, the lower interest rates. Now, if you're wanting down payment assistance, then there are certain requirements. You have to be at a 620 or higher, but the lowest that, um, for example, FHA will go down to a 550 minimum with 10% down and approval. So it just depends on the type of loan that you're shopping for and what you qualify for as well and what your wants, like Herbert said, what your wants, what your needs are. So we'll look at all that to see what fits best for your, your situation. Okay. I have to ask you, what about a person that is self-employed? What role does an employment play in getting a loan? Oh, that's a good question. So self-employment, we require at least a two-year history unless you're in the same industry. So for example, a truck driver that's working for a company that decides to go on their own. In that scenario, we can use a one-year tax return because they've been in that same line of work. 
or somebody that's in real estate that gets paid as a W-2, but then they decide to be a realtor, for example. Then in that case, we can use one year. But if you're starting off a new business from the ground, we need at least two years history of your tax returns. And just keep in mind, if you are self-employed, be very, very cautious. Speak to a lender if you're purchasing within the next year or two years. Because what happens is most people, when you're starting a business, your first couple years, you're going to have a lot of expenses, right? When we're looking at it on your tax returns, we're looking at what your expenses are and, and your gross profit, but or your gross receipts, should I say. But what we qualify you for is your net profit. And we average that out over the, the, the two years that you're providing. So if you're claiming a lot of expenses, we may not be able to qualify you as much because your net profit is not as high as it could be. So just be very cautious of your expenses and speak to a lender. Let them know what your goal is, what price range you're looking for. And we'll talk to you about what ideally where you need to be with income. That way you can budget for that or you can plan for that. Right. Because the higher income that you report, you're going to have to pay taxes on that. So just preparation is really the key. So, Would you like to add anything to that, Herbert? Yeah, but first of all, disclaimer, I, I didn't realize that the cleaning crew was coming in. They just came into the office. So <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, the, the, the one thing I'd like to add again, if you have somebody who can help you with, with your, your finances, and I'm assuming that um, if you're self-employed, you're working with an accountant, you know, also, you know, they're a good source to tap as far as do's and don'ts. Okay. If you let them know that your intention is to purchase property also, uh, they'll okay. give you guidelines how you, how you can, you know, grow your business and, and, and remain lucrative, right? And at the same time, prepare yourself for, um, for purchasing a home. Okay. Is it possible to purchase a home without a down payment? Ooh. Yes, there are certain loan types that will allow a no down payment. So if you are a veteran, for example, and you have a certificate of eligibility showing that you are eligible for a VA loan, then it is a zero down payment. Also, for buyers that are looking in, in rural areas, so any outskirts of DFW, that is a USDA loan, and it's also a zero down loan. We also... If we help you with down payment assistance, there is a debt, for example, if you go FHA or conventional, there is a down payment, but down payment assistance is giving up to 5% of assistance right now, which covers all your down payment and some of your closing costs. So essentially it's a zero down loan. And again, the thing you got to remember too, um, you know, so, so, and we are professionals in our market right here, but remember every market is different. I don't know that you have an, a national, but let's put this way. I, I think you have a global audience because I know you have a lot of folks um from jamaica who probably tune in also so you yes. know do your homework do your homework find out what's out there um don't be afraid of the process get professional guidance do not be afraid of the process if you again if you decide that home ownership is for you right do your homework and and i'll piggyback on what herbert says right now there are sellers that are are super motivated to to sell their home and they're willing to give seller concessions, which means not only can you get down payment assistance, but sellers can also help cover the rest of your closing cost. If not all, then most of them. So you're walking in. I mean, we've had a lot of buyers that walk in with very little on a, on a purchase of a home. So don't give up. If you think you don't have enough preparation, like I said, is key knowing and then having a real estate professional on your side, having the lender on your side. So Herbert can, See about negotiating now if it's a property that just went on the market this week you may not get help from the seller but if there's a property that's been out there 30 60 days you're more motivated to help out so don't give up just just keep saving would be the most important thing right now and then in worst case scenario if you don't have to use that money that's money that you can use for your appliances your furniture and things like that to um to prepare always save money great information and, and alongside, if I might, might piggyback on that too, um, again, you know, as you you start preparing to, to do something like that, you know, you know, if, if you need help with, um, you know, credit counseling, you know, um, don't be afraid to access that kind of help. Um, there are organizations out there like um, um, NACA, which is, um, um, remind me, Myra, what does NACA mean again? 
I don't know what it's called. National Association of um I've, I've, I've seen I've heard of NACA. I've yeah. heard of NACA. Yeah, it's an organization that will put you through the, the whole credit counseling process. I want to say anywhere from six months to a year. Right. Okay. To qualify, you have to meet certain eligibility. But but yes, in any in any home loan, we will send you what's called a home loan toolkit as well that will walk you through the whole process of what to look for to shop lenders to check out interest rates and things like that. So, but yes, NACA is also a, and, an organization and, that will help. And they might require you to attend classes. They might yes. might require sweat equity. You know, I had somebody ask me, "Hey, Herbert, what? When you say sweat?" equity what do you mean i don't know anything about building a home no it, it <laughs> might not be you know as elaborate yeah. as that it might mean yeah. you know um, <laughs> to, to, to prep the property do a little bit of painting it, it, if it's in your wheelhouse if it's something that you can do yes. but again you know there, there 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 there's there's programs that require some research and you you, you get the right help it makes a difference. It absolutely makes a difference. Yes, it, it, definitely. it shows you how, how it could be affordable. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. How important is it to be realistic about affordability? And I ask this because it's like you can see your dream home and you know deep down in your heart it's out of your budget. So how would you address that question? Oh, that's a good question. Um, realistic, being realistic about affordability is very important, right? Because you want to be able to know what you can afford without stretching your budget. You can want a $500,000 house. That can be your dream home. But once you see what that payment is, you may not be comfortable with paying that. So you, the pre-approval is very important because not only will it tell you what your buying power is, you will know what your estimated payment will be. And then and there is when you start preparing whether you want to make certain sacrifices. It's not that you may not qualify for it. Sometimes you have to make certain sacrifices. Do you need Starbucks every day? Well, no, I can make my coffee at home and be able to afford that home or not going out to eat, you know, every day. Uh, there's certain things that you will do if that's really your dream home. But knowing where you are, you don't want to overstretch yourself to the point where you're not able to make payments. A life situation comes up and you miss payments or ultimately end up losing the home because you overstretch that budget. So the pre-approval is very, very important to know where you wanna be and if you're comfortable with that payment as well. And, and again, like anything else, it requires discipline. You know, yeah. um, again, um, having the knowledge and then the discipline to apply that knowledge. Yes. Um, so once you want to know what, what steps you need to take, yeah, you know, you have to be disciplined with, your, you know, as far as creating the habits that will make you um, be able to keep that home, right, and pass it on to, 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 you know, your family. So maybe it's something to consider, too, to think. I know a lot of people, when they think about their dream home, they're thinking about brand new furniture. They're thinking <laughs> about, you know, just going all out. Yeah. So I guess we do have to be realistic about what's affordable yes. and making sure we can go to sleep at night. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, you're making those oh, purchases before you buy a house. Yeah. Right. And, and again, over time, you know, you might be able to sell that property once a property appreciates and buy something that's closer to your dream or your dream you know you might have had a change in you know in, in employment or that business that you started has grown to the point where you can afford more again yes. again the good thing about it is that one, one when you purchase you do build some equity and 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 you have you have something that you can look forward to if you're renting mm, there's not a whole lot that you can you can look forward to from 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 that home that right, you're in. That's, true. Yeah. that's a good point, Herbert. And also, you have to look at it like um, younger people, for example, twenties, thirties. They're wanting to buy a home, their dream home, and it's understandable, right? But you also have to look at where our parents started. Your dream home may be something in the future, but right now, what your budget is is a starter home. And like like Herbert said. Move into it for a couple of years, see if you're able to, with that payment, build your equity. And then in three, four years, see what your equity is, decide whether you want to rent that home, sell it, and then upsize from there. So don't give, you know, for, for the, the younger people, 
don't give up. A starter home is okay because that's where our parents started is with the starter yes. home. And they built up to where they are now. If they have a new home right now, you have to look at that. Don't don't try to rush that process to go into something that is very hard to afford. It may be very hard to afford, and you may have to sacrifice a lot for that dream home. But just get into a home, build your equity, and then decide what to do later on. And again, you know, just piggybacking on what Myra said, you know, the younger you are, the sooner you start, the easier it is to to uh, uh, um, to realize some kind of equity. The other thing is too, and the important thing is that you build certain disciplines, right? You know, um, it's habit forming. You, you you make your payments on time. Um, you start to learn how to, let's say, got a bit of job loss, right? You know, a lot of people think that, well, if they lose their job automatically, they're going to lose their home. Well, you got to start thinking about exit, exit strategy. God forbid something like that happens. How do I get out of this mortgage, right? Well, again, you know, you may be able to rent it and create some, some kind of income, right? So, you know, again, it comes back to preparation, doing your homework, um, and, 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 and figuring out exactly what you want. Please explain the home buying process. So the first step would be saving money. You always want to save money. I mentioned that earlier, but the pre-approval, it would be the, the very first step to knowing what your buying power is. So in that process, we look at your credit, we look at your income and what your assets are to be able to give you a price range of where you are. Now, if we give you a certain amount, let's just say we tell you you're approved for 500,000, you can purchase 200,000, but this is just for you to know in your budget what you're comfortable with, but you can approve up to this amount. The, the next step would be um, shopping for a home. Once you shop for a home, you'll put an offer on that property. If the offer gets accepted, everything starts from there. So within 30 days, you'll be owning that home if everything aligns, right? right. You will schedule a home inspection during that process. We'll order the appraisal to make sure that property is worth what you're purchasing it for because you're not going to go into anything that's not worth what they're selling it to, to you for. And within those 30 days, you're a homeowner. So prep, preparing for all that prior to, right? Getting your credit in order, having your money saved up, knowing where you're getting the money as well. If you don't have that money saved up, it can always come from your 401k, which is your own money. You can either take a loan against it. I don't suggest to withdraw it, but some people will choose to withdraw it. It can be a gift from family. So there's so many options, down payment assistance. There's there's just so many options to get people to, to ready to purchase a house. And, and and one of the first things I do when when I have somebody approach me is, you know, I, I find out if they're pre-qualified or pre-approval. Myra, Myra, what's the difference between pre-qualified and pre-approval? Good question. So pre-qualification is just the lender pulling your credit. Approving for a loan is not only what your credit score is. That is a, a huge misconception. Someone thinking they have an 800 credit score, they're going to qualify. No, you have to have the income. Your debts are taken into consideration. So what your debt to income ratio is very important. So a pre-qualification is a lender saying, okay, you have good credit and you're telling me what you make per month, then Here's a pre-qualification, not going into any specifics of what your income, what your assets are. Are you able to afford it? A pre-approval is us actually looking at all your income and asset documents, submitting it to a, an underwriter before you go under contract, because that typically doesn't happen until you go under contract. And they will verify your employment to make sure that you're able to afford and go under contract, because the last thing you want to do is have a pre-qualification, go under contract on a home, go spend your money on a, a deposit, go pay for an inspection, and then for that lender to tell you, oh, you don't qualify in the middle of the process. That would be the worst thing. Now, there's things that happen in the middle of the process. Transparency is key. For example, if we don't know, then there's things that can fall in line. For example, if you owe the IRS yeah. and you don't tell the lender, we don't know we're going through everything until the middle of the process we're doing our due diligence and it comes up hey you owe the irs and you didn't tell me about it so we're not here for a lot of people are, are intimidated by lenders 
we are here to help you through that process. We do not get paid until you're at the closing table, right? So our goal is to get you to the closing table. So transparency is very important. If I know that you owe the IRS, we're going to handle it before you go under contract, right? So those type of things can make a loan fall through, but having complete honesty and knowing that we have your back and our goal is to get you in a home is very, very important. So, so Myra, I got the question. Well, I don't didn't get the question, but I get it all the time. Pre-qualification versus pre-approval. Does my, my credit get hit on pre-qual or is it, is it only on pre-approval? So it depends on the lender. So Cardinal will do a hard inquiry only because a soft pool is only valid for that one day. So there's some lenders that will do a soft pool and pre-qualify you that day. But then when they they go to the next step of pre-approval, they're going to have to pull your credit as a hard inquiry. So pre-approval, most pre-quals are a hard inquiry. Okay. So you so want to avoid any hard inquiries prior to. So shopping for a car, getting a credit card. Right now, if you go to... For example, you go to the Rangers game. They're going to ask you, hey, do you want this free T-shirt? Apply for a credit card. That's a hard inquiry. So all of those things is where the pre preparation is very, very important for you to know, hey, I want to buy a house. I'm going to limit any credit inquiries. I'm going to save my money. I'm going to speak to a lender. I'm going to speak to my realtor about things of what not to do to avoid any hiccups during the process, right? What, what, what What's... What's the difference, Myra? <laughs> and I should know this, but I'm going to ask anyway, just for clarification. Between, you know, if I do a hard inquiry and a soft inquiry as far as it's affecting my credit score. So a soft inquiry will not affect your credit score. A hard inquiry will. And it can drop your score 10, 15 points or more, depending on how many inquiries you've had in the past. Right. So the, the more inquiries you've had, the more that affects you. But the good thing about credit is it changes every month, right? When you make a payment, it goes up. You may charge your credit card more than normal one month. That's going to impact your credit score. So it's not just the inquiries that are in, that are hurting you. It's what you're doing with your active credit now that can hurt you too. So it's not just a credit score. You may have had a lender pull your score. Then you go get a new credit card you max it out and you do all these things in one month, you're going to see a big drop in your score because of the activity. So don't get scared of a credit inquiry. I would get very concerned about multiple inquiries, especially a car. When you go to a car or shopping for a car, those dealerships will run your credit various times, which can impact your score. So, 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 <laughs> um, help me out here. Um, is it worth anything for me to freeze my credit or should I leave it where, you know, because again, on a month to month basis, sometimes you see some of these arbitrary inquiries into your credit score. Should I get in touch with all three credit bureaus and say, hey, no inquiries without my authorization? I think that any inquiries that are done without your consent should not be a hard inquiry because any hard inquiry will require your authorization. So okay. those inquiries that are done, if they're soft inquiries, they won't hurt you. Okay. A credit freeze helps you to avoid any identity theft, anybody using your credit. So it's important to freeze your credit scores. And once you're ready to use them, then unfreeze them. Okay. But I would say it's not something that's required, but it's, it's something to be cautious, you know, to have your credit frozen to make sure that nobody's running your credit without your authorization. I'd like to welcome Sherry Francis and Juliet Nelson, Irene Roper. Thank you so much for joining us. And Juliet has a question. She's asking, do you recommend that you pull your own credit prior to the home buying purchase process? That's a good question. And I would say yes. To When you pull your own credit, it does not impact your score. It's a soft inquiry you may not get the credit score that we will pull because a mortgage credit pool is different than a consumer pool, but at least you'll have a range of where you are. You'll be able to see your credit, what's reporting to your credit, if there's anything that you need to have disputed, for example. But before you dispute anything, talk to a lender because disputes can cause a big issue. If it's over a thousand dollars that you're disputing, it automatically will cause us on our side 
to manually downgrade you to a manual underwrite, which is not what you, you don't want that. You want an automated approval. So get with somebody before you do that. But pooling your own score does help for you to know that whatever's on your credit report is being actually accurately reported. And, and most of the credit bureaus now, I, I, when I'm speaking from my own experience, that they'll allow you to do an electronic inquiry and, and you know, you, you know, traditionally you've always heard that once a year you can you can ask from a credit report from each bureau or of what I call a summary report. Well, now you know, and I I I I, I didn't learn this until you know my, I was um, the subject of some online fraud um, back in 2022, back in June of 2022, and I learned a lot from the experience as far as how to protect my credit and all that kind of thing. And, you know, it, it's amazing. I mean, again, if you talk to a professional like Myra, they can guide you through all these things. Um, you know, but again, you want somebody who, who who's licensed, you know, um, and, 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 and does this for a living. Not your first cousin from Tubalo, Mississippi. <laughs> there you go. Let's talk about grants. Ooh, grants. So... Grants are essentially free money that you're getting from the state. For example, the state of Texas does grants that can help towards some or most of your down payment. The availability of grants depend on how much is available with that specific down payment assistance program. So if it's not a grant, we also have a large amount of people going with what's called a three-year forgivable second lien. It's a no payment second lien. You're getting up to 5% of assistance. As long as you live in the house for three years, it's automatically forgiven. So that's what most buyers are using because the availability of grants are very limited. But if there is a grant available, then yes, that is a great option to go with because essentially it is free money. You just have to live in the home for that one year for that loan. And then after that, you can turn it into an investment. You can upsize and and you know start building your portfolio if and you're again, wanting to invest. And again, you know, every state has their own program. And again, we're familiar with with wonderful Texas here. Um, so you, you got to make inquiries and find out what your state offers. Yes. Um, and then some of the bigger banks. I know, for example, Bank of America ha has um, some programs in place, right, Myra? I think they do. Right? Yes, we're, they do. For minority. Um, for minorities, yes. yes. The thing with Bank of America's program is you have to be comfortable with living in a certain area. So they will limit you to a certain zip code. But again, if that's something that you're okay with, then that's an option. But yes, Bank of America does have that that option. And, and I think um, the other big bank, um, Wells Fargo, also has, has something similar. So again, you know, it comes back to what we're talking about. Do your homework. So many your options. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It yes. just it's depends on options. what right. you, what you're comfortable with, right? Right. Um, I would like to welcome Heather Mother. So thank you so much for joining us. So my next question is: Are there credit worthiness programs to help consumers to get back on track in order to purchase a home? Yes, there are either credit repair companies that will help you improve your credit scores and also how to manage your money. I am a big advocate of Dave Ramsey. If you don't follow him, follow him because he gives a great financial advice. Aside from the, the his, his suggestion sometimes is if you don't have 20% to put down, don't buy a house. I don't agree with that. Um, but everything else when it comes to managing your money, he is very, very good about guiding you on what you, you know, we have this mentality of, I'm working, I work a lot, I deserve things, right? We have this mentality of I deserve it. Well, his his big thing is if you don't have it in your bank account to pay cash for, then you don't need it, right? It's not about deserving things. So managing money is the biggest part of it. You can make, I've seen people that make over six figures, but can't manage their money. And someone that makes half of that manage their money and be able to save money. So it all comes down to what you're spending your money on. How are you budgeting your money? Are you living paycheck to paycheck or are you telling your money where to go? And again, you know, earlier on, I mentioned the NACA. Um, yes. They're, they're 
you know, as far as um, you're living here in the United States, they're, they're national, of course. Um, and, you know, again, you know, you explore what your options are. Um, um, if, if you seek out the right help, right, there is a way. If you seek yeah. out the right help, there is a way. I'd like to welcome Andrew Green. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. So my next question is, what is um, what is an ideal first home purchase? So affordability would be yeah. ideally where you want to start. Um, things to think about is where you are and how long you're going to live in that home, right? If you're seeking out down payment assistance, for example, and we put you on a three-year forgivable second lien option, and you know you don't want to live in the house for more than a year, then that may not be an option. So considering how long you plan on staying there is very important. The location of where you're buying, if if the possibility of it reselling in a couple of years, what will your equity be? Things like that, I would say to, to keep in, in mind, if you're planning on growing your family, is a two bedroom home does that make sense for you if you already have two kids you know things like that um and being having the mindset of you might be in this first home for about five seven years is typically what how long people stay in their houses and then they'll either downsize or they'll they'll upsize from there so just knowing where you are where you want to be and keeping those things in mind of what what you need the the area for example if you know that you don't want to be in a busy intersection or around all the busyness of all shopping and things like that, then you can tell Herbert, hey, I want to be in a nice, quiet area. I don't want to be around all, you know, areas that there's a lot of shopping and there's a lot of traffic. So all of, keeping all that in mind, where you work, some people want to live where they close to where they work. Some people, it doesn't matter. So just knowing what you want and, and affordability would be the biggest thing, though, knowing what your power is. And your realtor, you know, you see when you have a, a licensed professional should sit down with you and go through, go, go through a needs list. Yes. And, and that's where that's where that individual's fo focus should be on what you need. Um, again, going back to your very first question, you know, um, is it ever too late? Again, you know, that's a that's a that's a discussion you have with your realtor. Um, you know, maybe maybe if you're a more mature individual like myself, you might not want to buy, you know, a seven bedroom home. You know, I mean, if you don't need it, you're not raising a family. You might, right. you might be better off with a, you know, two bedroom townhome or condo. Um, you know, again, knowing, knowing, knowing the difference between wants and needs, and 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 back to what Myra said, it being affordable, and and you know, have an idea of of of, you know, how much money you can get or how, how, how much money you have at, at your disposal, whether through self-financing or through a financial institution, you know, how much house you can buy. I have another question here from Juliet Nelson and, and she's asking, is the worst house in the best neighborhood still a consideration? That's, 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 a, um, that's a, a, a guideline that we've used in industry for a long time. Um, you, you, it's challenging to buy the most expensive home in a poor neighborhood because your equity is not going to be the same. Yes, you are better off to some degree buying you know, in the middle or closer towards the bottom. Again, and that, that depends on your financial, situ financial situation. If, 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 if resources are not an, a problem for you, if you have you know, the, the kind of liquidity, you might want to splurge, you know, so you might say, you know, I worked hard. I'm going to make sure I can do, you know, or, or I can get whatever I want in this home. But again, typically you don't want to buy at the very top of the neighborhood. You want to be in the middle or, you know, maybe just a little bit low because again, you know, the, the, the other, the other homes pull your equity up and that's what you're looking for. Okay. Uh, what should, back on that. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. I'm, go ahead. Go ahead, I'll Myra. I'm sorry. Back on go ahead. Um, only because you say the worst neighborhood, the worst home in the neighborhood. There are some loans that will allow you to do renovations and include that in the loan. So, for example, if you're wanting to purchase that home and renovate the kitchen, renovate the restrooms, that can all be 
part of the loan where you can do that all at once, but also do a, I would say a comparative market analysis, which Herbert can help you on to know what the equity would be after doing all those repairs. Does it make sense to do those repairs? Right. Yeah. So it, just, uh, just to keep that in mind. Again, you know, you know, like Mara is saying, let's say, for example, sample you're the recipient of one of these um, grants or whatever the case may be. Your, chance, your chances are that your zip codes are, are going to be somewhat limited as far as choice. So you might have to do renovations or improvements to get it to, to, to get it as close as possible to what you, you wanted, right? Yes. Um, yes, there, 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 there are options out there to do that kind of thing. I mean, but again, the, the main thing is you sit uh, sit down and you, you you realize how much you can do and not buy dog more than you can chew. Right. What should a home buyer consider before making this major purchase? I, I feel like um, affordability comes has <laughs> been coming up a lot. Uh, making sure that stability of your of your employment also if you see that your employment is changing so often for example you're at one job for a couple months the work goes down then you switch jobs when when we're looking at a home loan approval we're taking into consideration the overall risk it is to lend to a person right depending on their credit score depending on their income their assets and then also the stability so if there's someone that is changing jobs and we'll look at two year history. If someone has had 10 jobs in the last two years, that's a big risk. So you may have an 800 credit score, but the risk of employment can factor into you not having favorable terms. So one of the things would be, okay, is my job stable? Do I have some money set aside? For example, it may not be in your checking account, but you have a 401k. If something was to happen and you lose your job, there's something to fall back on. So just preparation and, and knowing that you're able to afford the home that you're wanting to purchase, I think would be the biggest thing because it's not only your down payment, you also have to budget for closing costs, your, which includes your taxes, your insurance, your, your prepaid items for that. So it's not just closing costs. And again, we talked about getting assistance for most of those things if you're, if you're needing the assistance, but budgeting for the overall cost of purchasing a home. And and, and um, again, do your research. I don't, I, I don't know how many of us, when I say us, I mean minorities understand that certain, there, there are certain incentives for people who serve in the military. There are incentives for people who are first responders, whether a nurse, uh, um, um, a firefighter or, or somebody who, who works in uh, law enforcement. There's, there's some favorable treatments for first responders, for military folks. And I know a lot of us minorities have served or have some connection. You know, we, we, you, know you, you walk into a hospital and the hospital, most of the, the people taking care of you are, you know, a, a minority. I mean, let's face it, right? Uh, but again, do your homework. You got you, you got to research and see what what's out there, what can help you afford that home. What are some of the mistakes that consumers should try to avoid? <laughs> Mara, that's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a very it's a very good question. Very very important because. Purchasing a vehicle, any large purchases. We talked about employment. So skipping or changing jobs is one of the things I would try not to do when you're thinking about buying a house. Because again, we talked about stability. So if you're if it's for the better, right? If you're if you're getting an increase of salary, things like that, it makes sense you it makes sense for you to move up, right? But if you can avoid it, it would be better for you to avoid it until after you purchase the home, if you can afford. And, and qualify for the home at the moment of what your current income is, right? So one of the things would be staying at that because if you're going from being at a job for 10 years and then once you decide to apply for a home, you've only been there for a couple months, that, that's a layering risk. So you want to be able to hang on to something that is very stable. Making large purchases, for example, a vehicle. 
a vehicle has now I'm scared to even look at credit reports where people buy new cars and there is no more $300, $400 payments. Now we're talking $600, $1,000 month worth of payments. So that factors, it's a huge factor in your debt to income ratio when someone has a car payment of $1,000. Let's just say they're making $3,000. Most of your money is going towards your car. You set aside, you know, let alone you still have to buy groceries. You still have to buy your, you know, you have a, a, a son or a daughter that you're having to pay tuition for. So there's a lot of things that I would avoid. Making large purchases for furniture. I know people get excited. I'm going to get a new house and I'm going to buy all this furniture before. That would be a mistake because, again, your goal is to try to go in with as little debt as possible to be able to qualify for more. So the less debt that you have, the more buying power you have. So wait until after you purchase a home and then you can go get a new car if you can afford it at that time. Right. But making a car purchase before a home purchase is a huge mistake that a lot of young people, young people make, too. Right. Because as soon as you start with your first job, the first thing you think about is I want a new car. Well, automatically you have to stop your purchase. Um, the thoughts of purchase for minimum five, seven years now, I've seen car terms be, right? Oh, so yeah. you have to really, parents, I would say parents guiding your kids to say, you know what, you may want a new car, but let's get you a cash car, save up as much as you can. And then in a couple of years, decide whether you want a new car or if your goal is to buy your own house, then there's sacrifices that you're going to have to make, right? Because it would be horrible for a parent to put their 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 21 year old and an 800 dollar car payment and then limit them and and then have them live with you for another <laughs> seven years. right so it's little things like that to to think about um making cash deposits so if you're buying a house and you're making large cash deposits there's a lot of people that still save money under their mattress right um i will say don't do that because we have heard cases of somebody's house um and this is somebody that already has a house, right? But somebody that had a house that was paid off. And once your house is paid off, you don't need insurance on it. But what happened? That person had money saved under their mattress and then the house burns down. Imagine the pain of losing all that money. Not only, not, not only the money, but your house. How are you going to rebuild? You have no insurance, right? So cash deposits are very difficult because there's no way to prove everything that that happens during a loan process, you have to document a lot of things. So if you deposit 10,000 in your bank account and I see that, I'm going to ask, where did this come from? If And with cash, you can't really prove where it came from. If you yeah. sold a car, if you sold jewelry, those are documentable purchase or, or sales, should I say, that you can show a title, you can show the tan transfer, you can show that you appraised a piece of jewelry or art and it's sold so anything that you could document is good but any cash i would avoid that so if you do that just make sure that it seasons for at least three months and then after that you can use that cash because it's seasoned but if you're thinking about purchasing the next couple months and you're using that cash for the purchase then it most likely you won't be able to use it so just a couple things to avoid i would say and then anecdotally, um, so we had something that happened here with, with, with our team where, you know, you know, one of my peers was working on a, a, a transaction and everything was going smoothly. And um, for whatever reason, this individual decided, well, you know what, you know, you know I'm signing everything within, you know, three days. Um, I'm going to go to rooms to go and I'm going to get everything I need. Guess what? The contract fell through. Yes. Right. It's because that, that major purchase, that person spent close to $5,000 at rooms mm -hmm. to go. Yes. That major purchase, right? Changed the condition that the person had, had the original approval. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you just don't do that. And make your, I don't know if I, if I mentioned this, but making your payments, it seems so obvious, right? Making your payments on time, but anything that's made over 30 days late reports negative on your credit. So you have to think about when we pull credit, we're looking at a seven year history of what you, what your credit history looks like, but the most important are what you've done in the last two years. 
So if you have made a credit card payment late, and it could be a $10 payment that they require, it's not the amount of money, it's the credit worthiness. If you were late on $10, a lender is going to look at it like, how are we going to trust you with $2,000, right? Mm -hmm. So important, very, very important to make your payments on time, no matter what the amount is, always, always. And if you are not disciplined to make payments, set them up on auto draft because Mm -hmm. Yes, we get busy with life and I get it that sometimes you forget and it's an oversight, but an oversight can lead you to not being able to qualify for a home. So make sure that your payments are made on time. How important is it to find the right realtor and the right financing? Very important. So we are going to be with you during that home buying process for minimum 30 days but i've had clients that i've worked with for years preparing them to purchase so you want someone that is going to be dedicated to it right that is dedicating a full-time job doing this and the availability of walking you through and guiding you through that process so there are some banks that are open eight to five try to call them after five o'clock good luck right so the good thing about us is we're available after five. Hey, I'm, I'm on a podcast on the Sunday, right? <laughs> um, try that with the bank. Uh, so just the availability, the, 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 the wisdom, the experience, the, um, the want to get minorities, especially into homes, right? Because it, it, it it's, some people don't think about it, but a thousand dollars, there's, I, I highly doubt there's a thousand dollar rent payments. But a thousand dollars, let's just make it easy math. You're wasting a thousand dollars on rent every month that's going nowhere. That's twelve thousand dollars if you had a thousand dollar rent, twelve thousand dollars a year that you could be putting towards your home and building equity. In a couple months, you may pull out twenty, thirty thousand dollars of equity and increase your your or upsize, right? Your home, mm -hmm. or decide to do something else, but that equity is there. So just keep it in mind, looking at what you pay per, for rent per month, multiply that by 12, and then multiply that by how long you've been in that apartment or how long you've been renting. It's a lot of money that's going to waste. And some people get comfortable with it. But no, knowing, like Herbert had said earlier, building your wealth, building wealth for your family, and, and knowing that later on, if it's not for you, hey, pull out your cash and go travel the world, right? But Right now, the rent is going nowhere. You're paying someone else's mortgage. And I, I think that. it's important for minorities to start building your wealth for your family and for building a legacy for yourself. And, and a lot of reasons why minorities are, 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 are afraid to do anything as far as home ownership. Again, they don't, they don't know what's out there. And, you know, the, the, the fear is that um, what if I have to move? What's going to happen? You have to consider what your exit strategy is. You know, so think long term, um, you know, another thing, well, Herbert, if I buy a home and I have to move, I'm going to lose that money. No, you don't have to. You know, I mean, you, your landlord, right, could decide that, guess what? I'm ready to sell the property right now and I need you to leave. Then what are you going to do? You see what I'm saying? So there is a degree of control that you don't have when you're renting as compared to um, when you own your home. Now, does the, the, the biggest hurdle is, is, is to get started. That's the biggest hurdle. And again, we, we've covered this quite a bit. There, there are options out there, but if you have a professional, and again, your original question was, you know, as far as finding a professional, you need to do an interview, interview the individual. I mean, you know, before I start going out there and showing anybody anything, I sit down and I tell them what I'm all about, what I can do and what I cannot do, right? So they know they know what the rules are. I tell them what my resources are. I said, you know, with, 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 this, with this group, with this brokerage, we have, you know, a lot of resources. We have, you know, judge fight insurance. We have um, Cardinal Financial. We have designated title. So we have a whole team of professionals that can help you, you know, make that pur purchase right and you know make sure that the person is licensed make sure the same thing for you for, for your um your, your mortgage originator your your, your your broker right um do the homework right 
a lot of people have, you know, said, well, I prefer to do, you know, one of those um, low, you know, cost uh, um, options that are out there. Um, you know, they talk about, um, you know, um, going strictly with, for example, Zillow or whatever the case may be. And again, you know, are you going to get that same level of, of service that you get from, you know, a, a, a personalized um, agent or realtor or a personalized broker? Juliet Nelson is asking, um, she said, any word that you can share on rent to own arrangements, do you recommend that, recommend this at this at this time? For some people that works, yes. Um, it's a good first step, especially if you're not familiar with the area. Um, let's say, for example, you're relocated because of work. All right. You don't know exactly where you want to live. Um, going through one of these rent to own programs, um, they can make a difference. Um, the, the one that we are affiliated with, um, you know, they will help you um, get into a rental property. The, the rent won't increase, right, for um, up to three years. And it gives you a chance to um, see what, you know, what's in the area. And, and if, if this is someplace that you want to live and you buy, when you decide to do purchase, if you do decide to purchase, right, it's a prearranged price. So entering a rental agreement, you are already know exactly what you're going to pay should you decide to purchase and guess what if you decide not to purchase you decide you don't like the neighborhood or 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 your your employment situation changes or you decide you're going to go back to jamaica whatever the case may be guess what you're not locked in you're not obligated on rent own now there are scams out there there are organizations that say they do rent to own you know and it cannot be substantiated so again it comes back to, to what, what what we've been saying all evening you know <laughs> do your research make sure that you're not signing up for something that's too good to be true all right that, that leads to my next question are there any scams that we should be aware of yeah, that's well, one of them <laughs> <laughs> that's one of them um they're right to own scams out there they're they're, they're title scams out there now what is title title is nothing more than you know let's say for example you're buying an existing home something something that's already in the market right then you want to make sure that that title is clean that title is clear title or deed in some states it's deed all right okay. um, yeah so you want to make sure that there are no liens what i mean by that you don't owe the irs any money and and you or if you owe them and they've slapped a lien on your property does that make sense the property that you're buying or another example is um, in, 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 in cases where it, it's a prop, property that's been liquidated through probate. Or another example might be um, airship, you know. Um, so, you know, four siblings inherit this property. Um, three want to sell it and one does not. There might be problems with title. There are title scams out there. There are um right to own scams out there so so again working with a credible organization is very important um that's a nice part of, about being you know uh, uh with a company like you know century 21 for me um you know we we do our research we help our, our folks and we're an established company do you find that desperation, you know, people with a low credit score, but they're so desperate to buy a home that they easily fall for some of these scams out there? Yes, that, that does happen, unfortunately, yes. You should never be desperate when you're making a major purchase like this. Um, you should be methodical. Um, you know, um, comes back to what, what we've been saying all night. Um, do your homework. Do your homework. Um, you know, Use your resources out there and, and find out exactly what's available, right? And get one opinion, two opinions. You're talking to an you're talking to a realtor, interview them, have a set, set a list of questions that you're gonna ask. Um, talk to somebody else who 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 you know is um credible, who already owns a home and ask them what their experience was, you know. Um, and again, well, don't talk to just one, talk to multiple. 
right? And then whenever you start talking to your realtor, whenever you start talking to your your, your, your mortgage bank or your, your, your loan originator, sit down, ask the pertinent questions, have, have them give you a defined map of what the process is going to be, all right? Is you there any, can you, um, if you're going with a realtor or, you know, or for or you're financing, is there a way to do like a check to make sure this organization or this realtor is legit? Well, you probably can't go wrong using, you know, some of the big, big names out there, the Remaxes of the world, the yeah. you know, Super 21s. You probably won't go wrong there. But again, you know, once you decide you want to go with this person or this organization, even then, don't don't start signing anything until you 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 talk to them, verify their licenses, make sure that they have a license. Um, you know, every every everybody who um, buys and sells home professionally, they, they they should be licensed. Okay, Myra. Google would be your best friend, right? Because anybody that's licensed, as soon as you put your name or or their name in Google. It will come up either with reviews, what company they're with. So you should be able to have that as a starting point, you know, instead of having to say, hey, let me verify your license. Just Google them. You'll, you'll, you'll quickly see who they're with, at least, right? If there's no reviews or anything, at least you'll be able to see, okay, he's telling me the truth. He's with this company, you know. Um, but going back to fraud as well, and not only with the listings, the rentals, but it also happens with owners, for sale by owners, for example, when you said desperation, somebody that has a really good, uh, low credit score or minorities that don't have a social, they mm -hmm. fall in for these traps of people asking for 10% down and they don't even know if they own the property. Like Herbert said, they yeah. are not on the deed, but they're saying this is their property. So be very cautious of giving that much money to someone without doing your due diligence. A realtor will be able to tell you hey, this property is owned by this person. Is that the one that's trying to make this offer with you? So be do your research like, like Herbert said. And, and, you know, and every, a lot of money. Every state has a board of realtors, every state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mm -hmm. can always double check that state's board of realtors because again, you know, you look me up here in Texas and guess what? You'll see my license number, you'll see which book brokerage I'm affiliated with and all, everything. You know, 100% it, 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 transparency, nothing hidden. OK, mm -hmm. um, some states require attorneys to assist in transactions. Mm -hmm. um, you do the same same kind of legwork. You know, you, you, you scrutinize it. Make sure, you know, that all the information that you're getting is accurate. Yeah. Mike, he's saying you can always look at people who are licensed. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's and that's and that's important. I tell you, you guys have shared a lot of great information tonight, and I'm hoping that you'll come back in the near future. I would love for you guys to come back, and I'd like to ask you both now to share your closing thoughts. Herbert, you want me to go first? <laughs> go ahead. Um, go Go for it. My closing thoughts would be, do not ever think that you can't do it. You have to believe it, and you have to want it. This is a process that is not for the faint at heart. I say that over and over, and I probably will be the person that you dislike the most, right? Because I ask for so many documents. You might think that I'm asking for your blood type the next <laughs> day, right? But it is, it, it, you have to think about it as with the lender, I, I will say on my standpoint, it would be if your friend or your family member asked you for $100,000, would you just give it to them? No, right? It's a lot of money that, that, this lender is giving you. So be ready to provide a lot of documentation. The, the more open you are with providing that documentation, the smoother the process will be. You will be asked for a lot, but it is so worth it when you have those keys in your hand. You won't have to give me anything else after you have those keys in your hand. So just know that it is a process, but you, it's worth it. It's worth it to own a home and, and have your own space to have the liberty to paint a wall if you want to paint a wall, right? Not have to, to pull up to your driveway without having to have someone next to you ding your door at an apartment complex. Um, not hearing thumps if you're on the first floor and the thumps from upstairs. Um, just having your own yard, having your own space. It is a liberty that, that I think everybody should have the privilege to have. And um, if you have kids, 
having that legacy for them. I mean, it's just starting and and not giving up would be my my thoughts. So so I, I would end with how we started. Is it too late? No, it's never too late. Back to what Myra said, depends on what you want. Clearly define what you want and get help with the steps on how to accomplish it. Find 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 good resources. Um, don't, refer, don't be afraid of the interest rate. Um, I think I told you this the first time, you and I had a conversation, Bree, that my very first home in Florida, I paid 8%. And I, that was normal back then. Yeah. Um, we've gotten accustomed to what's going on now. Um, you know, you know, during COVID, where interest rates were, were ridiculously low. Mm -hmm. But that's really not the norm. Yes. Um, the, the, the norm is, you know, is so, somewhere in between what it was and, you know, I'd say 4.55%. That might be the norm. And again, the, the, the market ebbs and flows. That's the bottom line, right? But again, housing over history has usually appreciated. And again, back to the original conversation that we had, you know, is it a good tool? Is it a viable tool to 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 to, to create some kind of generational um, legacy? Yes, I, you know my experience it has been that it is. Is is it perfect? No, like anything else. I mean, you know, some people might say, well, you know, I, it's a stock market. That's, that's that's better, but that ebbs and flows also, right? Yes. Oh, it's a hundred percent business, but that ebbs and flows. There's always a risk to anything that you do. But again, everybody needs a home. Everybody needs a home. And there's a certain that amount so of pride that you feel, just like Myra said, when you own your own home. Yes. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate all the information that you shared. And I'd like to say to the viewers who watch the replay, please feel free to post your questions or comments. And, you know, like I said earlier, I hope that you guys will come back to share some more information with us. Yeah, well, I hope you invite us. Yes. Thank you yeah, for having us on. Thank you so it much, a, guys. It was a great thank privilege. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'm wishing everyone a great week and thanks for tuning in.